A couple years ago, Honda resurrected the Passport name in America. We hadn't seen this nameplate for over 20 years, and it was designed to bridge the gap for buyers coming from a CRV, but didn't want something quite as large as the three-row Honda Pilot. Now, unfortunately for Honda, the Passport didn't really do anything in terms of off-road capability, which is why I'm out here just south of Palm Springs, California, with the Salton Sea behind us to drive this model here. This is the refreshed 2022 Passport Trail Sport. The Trail Sport badge essentially means this is the more off-road ready version of the Passport because in addition to revised styling on the outside and a slightly tweaked interior, Honda has given this car some off-road tires, special wheels, and just a more rugged overall look. So the big question I went and answered, has Honda managed to make the Passport Trail Sport more off-road capable? Stay tuned to find out. So on this blustery day here in Palm Springs, California, Rob and I are testing the refreshed Passport Trail Sport. And we first drove the Passport a couple years ago. We were actually in Moab, Utah. Well, Honda actually had a pretty significant off-road course for us to drive on. So obviously for the refreshed model, we're actually gonna be driving this car on an off-road course tomorrow. However, today, let's go ahead and talk about the styling changes that Honda has made to the Passport for 2022. Now, obviously, if you guys like the refreshed ridge line, it essentially has the same front end, which is a good thing because the old one looked a little bit too anonymous. It looked a little bit too much like a mommy crossover. The grille is significantly larger here. It's got the blacked out accents, of course. It's got these kind of pewter gray in the grille with this massive Trail Sport badge here with the red accents. Honda says you can expect to see a bunch of Trail Sport models in the coming years. I'm gonna suspect the ridge line will probably be next. All Passports now come standard with full LED headlights. You can see LED uh, low beam right here, LED daytime running lights, incandescent turn signals. However, it looks like the fog light has been repositioned. Uh, it used to be down here at the lower bumper. Now it's actually in the headlight assembly. The front fascia also has, oh, <laughs> can't see. I can't see. I couldn't see the fog light. It's down there. <laughs> actually, it is down there. I couldn't see it from the angle from where I was standing at, but you can see also there's a lot more black plastic here to give this more of a rugged look. And I think the the refresh is definitely successful. It gives the Passport a more truck-like truck, truck -like look to it, which is kind of important because this is something that, you know, people buy this not because it's a three-row crossover like a Pilot. You want this thing to stand out in a more rugged way. Now, in terms of the side profile, you can see here, they didn't change the overall size. This vehicle is still around 189 inches long. It's roughly six inches shorter than a Pilot. The wheelbase is also the same. The wheels and tires. Now, because Honda has essentially removed the base trim, all passports either come with a 20 inch wheel or this 18 inch wheel that's specific to the Trail Sport model. You can see the 18 inch wheel is necessary for them to put these uh, Firestone Destination all terrain looking tires. These are kind of like a sport terrain tire. It's not a full all terrain like you might find on like a Jeep Wrangler, but you can see it does improve the look of this vehicle. I'm surprised that Honda actually didn't make the fender flares a little bit wider here to kind of give this more of that off road look. Now, if you guys are also wondering in terms of ground clearance, Honda rates the Passport Trail Sport at around 8.1 inches. Now, 8.1 is actually the same as last year. It's a little bit more ground clearance versus the front wheel drive model, which you can still get on an EXL trim. But you should know something like a Subaru Outback Wilderness is going to offer around nine and a half inches. So it's a little surprising that Honda didn't actually jack this vehicle up a little bit higher. They also didn't give it any skid plates or make any adjustments to the all-wheel drive system, which we'll talk about later on when we drive this vehicle. Now you can see here the roof rails are pretty significant here. You can put something, you know, something like a, um, a tent up here if you'd like. And you can see there's also a standard size sunroof. Honda sadly does not offer a full panel roof. Uh, on this model. I believe you can get something uh, like that on the Pilot uh, or on the Acura MDX, but sadly the Passport does not get that. Now at the rear, you can see the design changes are pretty minimal. Uh, you have kind of like an LED combination for the taillight. You can see the turn signal is incandescent. The brake light and taillight is actually LED. There's this new black strip that kind of goes across the side. And then you can see there's also another orange accented Trail Sport badge out here. The badging in the front and the rear and the wheels are really gonna be your only indication. And you can see Honda has also redesigned the exhaust tips. They are a really nice look. It's a dual chrome outlet and the diameter of the exhaust is larger this year. They didn't actually improve the sound. You still have that 3.5 liter V6 and you have again more of that black plastic here to make this vehicle uh, look a little bit more rugged. They also managed to widen the track by about 0.4 inches and that gives it a more aggressive looking stance. Now a power lift gate is standard on the Trailsport model. This is now the mid trim. And you can see here with all of our suitcase back here, uh, you get around 41 cubic feet of space. 41 is significant. This is actually one of the higher in the segment. If you fold down the second row seats, it actually expands it out to around 77.7 .7 cubic feet. So it's obviously a little bit less than a Pilot, but it also is one of the largest in the segment. And if you look underneath here, there's also some pretty nice under uh, cargo floor storage when you need to put uh, items down there to hide from prying eyes. 
So moving on to the interior of the Trail Sport model, first stepping in, it has a really easy step in height. And then when I shut the door, the door sounds nice and solid. So that actually adds to the impression of quality in here. Now, looking at the key fob, you can see this is the current key fob that Honda uses on a lot of their products. Intelligent access key is standard. This does have a remote start on the fob. I also like the positioning of the button, the start stop button here. It's right in your line of sight. And then when you turn it on, it actually changes color from white to red. Uh, and it shows that the vehicle is on once the vehicle started, that turns red. And as you can see, the dash in here hasn't really changed, which we'll talk about that in just a moment. The Trail Sport model, because it's now in the mid trim, it actually includes these leather seats. And you can see there's orange stitching over here, which does add a little bit of cool contrast to the interior. And the Trail Sport models also have this Trail Sport badge on the head restraint here. They're on both head restraints just to remind everybody that you have the special Trail Sport off-road capable version. And there's also more orange stitching here on the steering wheel, which is leather wrapped. The seats themselves are also heated on the front. Uh, they offer two-person memory, and the driver's seat here is a 10-way power adjustment. Only a four-way power on the passenger side, however, so that's something to keep in mind. If you guys want ventilated seats, you're going to have to go for the Elite version. The Elite version, of course, is one trim higher versus this model. Now, looking at the rest of this cabin, you can see this dashboard is definitely starting to look pretty dated. Remember, this dates back to the Pilot when it came out in 2016. You can see you do have a soft-touch injection molded plastic here. There's some faux stitching here on the upper part of the dash. The Trail Sport model includes kind of this texturized metal look trim, which again, is kind of cheap plastic when you actually touch it. This is hard touch plastic down here. And you can see in terms of the steering wheel, it does have a tilt and telescoping function and it offers a pretty good amount of adjustability. I can kind of get into this car and get comfortable pretty easily. You can see the steering wheel. This is an older steering wheel. It's got the cruise control buttons here for the Honda Sensing. It's got your audio control buttons over here, the horn. Sounds pretty good. It's very appropriate considering the size of this vehicle. And looking at the door panels here, you can see soft touch injection molded plastic. Uh, you have power windows over here, which are auto up down for the front windows, which is nice. Uh, and then there is a lot of dark trim in here. I kind of wish that Honda had added more to kind of brighten up the cabin. But overall, the tech is really where you start to see the age of this vehicle. I mean, you can see it's got tri-zone climate control here. Uh, but uh, the screen here is only eight inches. This is the standard screen that you get. It does include Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but it's a wired connection. It doesn't offer the wireless. Keep in mind, something like the new Honda Civic offers a larger screen. The Civic offers a nine inch screen. This is an eight inch screen. Also the stereo system in this car, they don't offer like the premium Bose stereo you find in the Civic. This is just their Honda premium system, which sounds okay. It's nothing groundbreaking. And then over here, you can see on the screen, you have traditional analog gauges for the fuel and the temp, but you can see there's a digital display there, which again, looks pretty dated. You kind of can change a couple of features here and show like the IVTM4. That's pretty nice, but keep in mind, some competitors offer a fully digital screen. You have paddles on the wheel over here. And then over here, you can see this is where it takes a lot of the inspiration from the pilot. You have three level heated seats, a little bit of storage over here, wireless phone charging pad, which is nice. This controls the nine speed automatic transmission. Put the vehicle in reverse. You can see there's your backup camera, which gives you two different or three different views. It has rear cross traffic. Uh, alert and automatic braking. So that's nice. No full 360 camera, no pilot or passport offers that. Uh, over here, you can see um, there is a drive mode selector where you can go between a normal sand or snow and mud mode, which will essentially just tweak the four wheel drive system and adjust the traction control. This doesn't actually have adaptive dampers. It does come with a four wheel independent suspension, which should improve the ride quality on rough surfaces. Down in here, you can see massive storage area with another USB charging port, a 12 volt over there. Uh, which has this nice little lid. This also has a nice cover that feels really sturdy. And the armrest here still kind of adjust, which is great. Each front seat has their own specific armrest, which I really like. And then overall, you can see on the glove box, you can see it's a bin style. It's damped, but not lined with felt. So a typical um, SUV fashion, you have a lot of storage in here, but it also feels a little bit dated. It feels a little minivan-like. Above me, you can see standard sunroof. Honda does not offer uh, a panel roof. And then the lighting in here is just all incandescent. So I really wish that Honda would have upgraded that. So if you guys like the interior of a lot of other Honda products, this will feel really familiar and nice. But if you check out the competition, you're going to see just how behind Honda is in the tech. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what they have up their sleeve for the next generation Pilot and Passport. Now, in terms of the back seat, also, this is an area where the Passport has always been pretty strong. There is about 37 and a half inches of legroom back here, which actually isn't a lot by the numbers, but you can see at five foot seven, I get back here, there's plenty of room. There's actually a completely flat floor here, which is nice. You have two USB charging ports, an actual power outlet over here. And then you can see there's rear seat air vents. Sadly, no uh, individual rear climate controls, which would have been nice to have. In terms of the materials, it is hard touch plastic on the upper door panels, but the Trail Sport model includes these manual rear seat sunshades. No heated back seats back here, but it is nicely softly padded over here on the armrest. And then if you Look over here, you can see there's also an armrest that folds down and gives you two cup holders. And if you'd like, you can actually move these seats forward and back. 
and you can also recline them ever so slightly. So the back seat of the Passport is definitely still tops in the class. I would actually put this at the same level as the Volkswagen Atlas Cross Sport. Now under the hood of the Passport Trail Sport, we find the same engine as last year. This is the company's 3.5 liter uh, single overhead cam iVTEC V6. It doesn't even have direct injection. This engine, Honda has been using it for over 20 years. It still makes 280 horsepower and 262 pound-feet of torque. Those numbers are actually pretty good for the segment, but you should know that Honda doesn't offer any electrified option. They don't offer any turbocharged option. You still get only one transmission, the company's nine-speed automatic, which is technically built by ZF. I'm surprised Honda didn't put their 10-speed auto that you might find in some of their newer products. Fuel economy is rated at 19 in the city, 24 on the highway. Zero to 60 should be around the six and a half second range and passports are still able to tow a maximum of 5,000 pounds, which is pretty good for the segment. And as this one sits, it weighs in at around 4,300 pounds. All right, so it's a rather confusing weather day here in Palm Springs, California. Well, technically we're about an hour south of Palm Springs on our way to Borrego Springs. Uh, but Rob and I, we've had some a lot of time with the Passport and the Pilot. This was actually one of our first cars that we drove at a Honda Media Drive, our first Media Drive like back in 2015. So this generation is definitely due for a redesign. Uh, and when the Passport came out last year or two years ago, I was kind of like a little disappointed because it essentially was just a shortened version of the Pilot and I wanted Honda to do more. So this is kind of their attempt to do more. And I have to say, I do like the changes they made to the styling. Um, I think the vehicle looks a little bit more rugged. It looks a little bit more distinctive. Um, I also think that Honda could have done more to the Trail Sport model. I mean, we're right now on this kind of sandy ro dirt road uh, where we were filming this car over by the Salton Sea. And I have the car in sand mode right now. So the car is on these Falcon all-terrain tires or, or Firestone all-terrain tires. And I have it in sand mode that turns the stability control off. I'm just gonna put my foot down here and you can see. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. <laughs> he might have got a mouthful of sand. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> but it puts the power down well. This is Honda's IVTM4, which stands for Variable Torque Management a four-wheel drive with intelligence, technically an all-wheel drive system. This is technically just a rebranded version of Acura Super Handling All-Wheel Drive because it has the ability to send torque to the front and from the front to the back and then side to side. It has true torque vectoring, which makes this car's four-wheel drive system really good. And we also have 8.1 inches of ground clearance, which is fine. It's not the most that you'll find in the segment, uh, but I, I really wish that Honda had given this thing maybe like a one inch lift or given us uh, some skid plates underneath, some even meteor tires. Honda claims that the next generation of Trail Sport models will include more kit. But it makes me wonder why couldn't they just do that for this model here? Now granted, this is already pretty capable. For a car that comes, you know, based off of a Honda Odyssey, um, the steering in this car is really smooth. The suspension, because it's four-wheel independent, soaks up this kind of, you know, bumpy dirt road that we're on right now. And you can see here, I'm trying to see if I can get the stat a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. <laughs> I'm good, I'm ready. <laughs> it's actually kind of fun. I actually genuinely like the way this car drives, but you know, most people who buy this vehicle, they're not gonna be driving it off-roading much. They might do this, like a dirt road, or maybe do a little bit of sand, but let's get this out on the highway because this is where people are gonna be driving this car most of the time. And now as we get back onto paved roads, let's go ahead and test out the zero to 60 performance of this vehicle. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it into normal mode. We're gonna put the transmission into sport mode here. Uh, and there was actually a Mustang that was on that road over there. So clearly it's not that impressive. <laughs> Off-roading, yeah, that was a Mustang, <laughs> an old Mustang. But let's go ahead and try out the zero to 60 for this vehicle. I'll brake torque it a little. I hear the VTEC. <laughs> All right, we got 7.47 seconds there. It's actually a little bit slower than what I was thinking this car could do, but I also didn't like how it kind of bogged down. So let's go ahead and try it one more time because literally there's a big open road here for us. I'll turn off the traction control. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not gonna brake target this time, I'm just gonna floor it. Okay, that was a little more responsive. Listen to that VTEC. 7.1. <laughs> 7.09, there, there we go. <laughs> now we also are slightly going uphill here, so this car could easily do it in under seven seconds, which I think is perfectly acceptable. These tires are slowing it down. I definitely think the tires are slowing it down. Honda's added a little more weight as well, so it's not obviously as fast as it used to be, but it still offers plenty of power. 
the nine speed auto honda's done some fiddling with the tuning i mean this nine speed is from zf which we didn't like this transmission when it first came out it's gotten better but it's still not as good as the 10 speed this engine is perfectly good if you guys like a v6 you like that it's naturally aspirated you know it's going to last a long time because honda's had this v6 in production for 20 plus years and i have to admit it still makes this vehicle really nice to drive and as we get here back on the highways we head toward borrego springs come on there we go downshift for me there we go <laughs> but listen to that vtech that's not <laughs> can, we, can we find an intake <laughs> no rob we can't put an intake on your family <laughs> suv <laughs> but this kind of just feels nostalgic to me because i i've loved i've loved hondas for so long when i was a kid i love the vtech crossover noise and you're gonna miss stuff like this because we are heading toward electrification. Honda will be doing an all-electric SUV in the next couple of years called the Prologue or something. It's built off their Altium platform from shared with GM, but this feels good. Like it still drives nice. It's still very smooth. The steering still feels really easy to use. It, it still offers a lot of precision. The ride quality is also good as well. Uh, like out there on that dirt road, you can it really soaked up the bumps. And here on the highway, you can feel this is tuned a lot for comfort. So in terms of sportiness, the Passport is definitely not there. The Trail Sport model kind of goes a little further toward comfort as well. I imagine the Elite model with the 20-inch wheels are probably going to be a little bit sporty, but they're also going to ride a little bit more harsher. Um, and then the interior itself, in terms of noise, Hondas have generally been on the louder side for the competition. This one here is a little bit loud as well. I mean, I'm hearing a lot of wind noise, some road noise, but this road surface here is concrete. So I'll have to wait until I get this back home uh, to test it out again for noise. But at least, you know, as I sit here, the seats are very comfortable. I love this adjustable armrest here. I wish Honda would offer cooled seats on this model. You have to go to the Elite version. In terms of their driver assistance, Honda actually was one of the first to do a really good lane keep assist function. So as I turn the cruise control on here, set the adaptive function. You can see it shows right there in your in that little display what you've set it at. And also will actually keep in keep the vehicle in the lane. Although it does kind of ping pong back and forth a little bit. And then the, I noticed that it's really slow to actually speed the vehicle up because that nine speed is a little bit sluggish to respond. But as we go along this gener gentle curve here, you can see it's not really staying in the lane that well. <laughs> and it's actually started to nudge the wheel because it was riding the line. But it is a very nice aid. Honda, again, like I said, was one of the first to do their Honda sensing. And it's a really good system, although it's definitely been surpassed. And I hope Honda is working on an even more updated system to kind of go with the rest of the competition. But uh, the weather here is just absolutely crazy. You can barely see it in front of you. And this is, again, we are in Southern California heading toward Borrego Springs. This, it probably rains here in Palm Springs probably like five times a year. And we just happen to be here when it's actually raining. But being in this SUV that sits up nice and high, that's comfortable, it does feel, you know, very secure, very safe. Uh, and this is probably why people buy SUVs like this because you're you know, driving in these kind of conditions. You want the capability, you want the comfort, you want the space. The Passport certainly offers it. I'm just not entirely sure Honda has done enough here to make this car stand out in terms of technology or stand out in terms of its off-road capability. All right, so it's day two here, uh, just outside of Borrego Springs, and the weather has finally cleared up. So that horrible storm that we shot in yesterday is gone, and it's now sunny, it's warm. It's the typical California weather that we're used to when we come out here. And Honda has put us on this really nice off-road course to showcase the Trail Sports off-road capabil capability. Now remember, we have these all-terrain looking tires. We still have 8.1 inches of ground clearance. And then we have Honda's excellent variable torque management all-wheel drive system, which is basically uh, a renamed version of Acura Super Handling all-wheel drive because it can send up to 70% of the power to the back or do 50-50, and it can also send up to 100% of the power side to side. Now, the Passport Trail Sport should never really be compared to something like a Jeep Wrangler um, or even a Jeep Grand Cherokee. I mean, this, this crossover is certainly more capable than your average crossover with 20 to 21 inch wheels on it. But you have to keep in mind, we don't have ground clear or we don't have uh, skid plates. We don't have, you know, additional ground clearance. 8.1 is certainly fine, but I wouldn't want to roll over some of these bigger boulders that we're seeing here. But you know what? For a mommy crossover, it certainly is handling this very well. Uh, the suspension soaks up the bumps nicely because of the all independent suspension layout. Uh, you can even see sometimes the wheels lifting up and the car is bringing a wheel down while it articulates, which obviously it's not going to articulate quite as well as like the new Grand Cherokee that we just drove, but it's not bad considering, you know, what Honda is working here. This is their global, just go center right on that big boulder there. this is their global light truck platform. 
uh, and it does a pretty good job of just uh, getting you through these kind of terrain, which I don't imagine most passport owners are going to do this kind of terrain. I mean, I guess the sand they probably would. Like, you could take this vehicle to the beach, deflate the tires, um, and it should be able to handle, you know, this kind of terrain. I, I wouldn't take this thing rock crawling, but you know what? It is pretty comfortable, and you can really feel the all-wheel drive system doing its work here. I mean, I have the all-wheel drive system in sand mode right now, and it turns the stability control down, uh, backs that off, and also tries to give you more momentum so you don't lose lose that and gets the get the vehicle stuck and then you can also see in the display here the variable torque management four-wheel drive system appropriating the power to the wheel with the most traction and you know what it's a lot more capable than I thought it would be I'm just not entirely sure that I would pro I, pro I might still choose the Subaru Outback Wilderness. I really come back to that car because it has more ground clearance in this car, like an inch and a half more ground clearance, and it's also less expensive, but we'll talk about that later on in the conclusion. You have to give Honda credit for working with what they've got here, but for now, you have to also remember the Trail Sport model essentially just gives you the same capability that the Passport has always had, which it, ha it has decent capability. Try to stay a little high left on that curve there. Um, it just gives you a slightly more rugged look but Honda has promised that future versions of the Trail Sport models will be their flagship for their light truck series and it'll, it will actually introduce eventually more serious tires, more ground clearance, skid plates. And I imagine we might see something like that on the next generation Ridgeline in the next couple of years. Straight, just like that. The left hand. Stop, stop, stop. Mm. Left hand. Yep. Keep going. Okay, straight, straight. Now keep coming over. Go to the right. Follow that line. Maybe in the middle of the desert. <laughs> <laughs> I got a really bad. I got a really nasty shot of literally scraping the front off that that oh, low shit. lip on the front. He, he also said that they accidentally backed into a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh boy. <laughs> so with knobbier tires and one of the best all-wheel drive systems in the business with a sand mode, let's go ahead and see if the new Passport Trail Sport can do a donut. Close the window. Pretty impressive. <laughs> so after spending the past couple of days driving the new Passport Trail Sport on some trails that you probably wouldn't expect to see a family crossover like this on, I have to say this vehicle already had some pretty strong off-road chops. I mean, considering the platform that Honda had to work here, it's got one of the best all-wheel drive systems that you'll find in the business. And obviously, for the Trail Sport model, Honda made some styling improvements to it. It certainly looks a lot more rugged, but I also question some of the decisions they made. For example, I wanted them to add more ground clearance. I wanted them to add skid plates. I also wonder about this really low front lip, which as you guys can see, got scraped a couple of times while we were out here on these trails by some rocks. So again, it's going to make you wanna go a little bit slower than something like if you were in a Jeep, for example, or even Subaru's new Outback Wilderness has more ground clearance than this vehicle. But as you can see, the changes that Honda made were pretty subtle. This is still a very comfortable to drive vehicle on the highway. It has pretty decent performance from the standard 3.5 liter V6, and it offers one of the most roomiest cabins in the segment, even though the tech is pretty dated. But with all that said, this is still a really excellent choice if you guys want a more proven mid-size family car Crossover. Now, speaking of which, this new Passport is already on sale, and it starts now at $37,870 for the base EXL. This is about $6,000 more versus the previous 2021 model because Honda got rid of the base Sport trim, but they did, of course, add more equipment. Uh, the Trail Sport model that I'm driving here stickers for about $44,000 with destination, which is like $12,25. 
It, it, it does represent a good value. Keep in mind, you can go up to the Elite trim, which adds things like the heated and cooled seats, uh, which will cost around $47,000. $44,000 for this is, again, a pretty good deal. But keep in mind, you can get something like the Subaru Outback Wilderness for about $4,000 less. You can also get a Toyota 4Runner TRD Off-Road for about the same price as well. And then of course you can also choose something like the Kia Sorento X-Line, which again is about the same size and offers pretty similar performance, but you also have that turbocharged engine. So there's a lot of competition in the segment. The Passport certainly still has some unique qualities of it that keep it uh, competitive. However, I do think that Honda needs to do more. So I am very excited to see what they plan to do for the next generation of trail sport models. But with all that said, I hope you guys have enjoyed my full overview on the 2022 Honda Passport Trail Sport. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews, like us on Facebook. And as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.